een probleem ben. Ik ga niet op de AC YouTube page wees, ek gaan op die Kara website. Voor een of andere reden wil hy nie live gaan. Soos ek gesê het, ek soek net dat jy as jy nie kan okay, besis vir. Ja. Hoek die groep nie af. Okay, cool. Thank you. Will you just put that in the front pocket? Um, because this thing has to have a line of sight. Okay. Yeah, uh, so don't go too far from that. Uh, you can. Uh, we tested it yesterday from that position. Is it perfect? Up until that corner there and until here. So it's everything's really perfect. As long as it's just in front, is it perfect? Can I clip it like this? Yeah, just inside. Yeah, that's fine. There we go. Yeah. Oh, cool. Should I shoot over or? No, it doesn't matter. I'm assuming it'll have a presenter view on there. Where's the toilet around here? Just here. Maybe I should shoot there quickly. Let me check with your sound guy. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> what is that sound? <laughs> Sorry, but I'm just gonna run to the toilet quickly. Is all right.
It is charging. I don't even see it charging. Uh, I, I saw it charging just now. Oh, okay, cool. Can't you see it? <laughs> yeah, actually. Yes, I do. And you know about this function here. Which one? This function. No, what the hell is that? Click on it. And then you can see. Uh, yeah, that's the pointer, isn't it? Just click in. But I, I, I learned this week that you can pen and you can write with it. Oh, really? Okay, I don't really need... Well... Are you ready? I guess so. Some time? Yeah, it's five to eleven. Oh, so we got some I time. I told them to start to be here at the two. Oh, so, oh, so we... get stuck into it. This is going to be more of like a discussion, so I hope we have... Oh yeah. You ready? When you ready? Henry, shout out.
Thanks, guys. Thank you for that. Thank you, Carla, for that introduction. Uh, most of all, yeah, I wish, eh? But uh, <laughs> so, yes, I have had um, many positions in the conservation industry, uh, both here in South Africa, the United States. So, yeah, I've, uh, I did kind of travel around, but I started off exactly where you, you guys are here, in Pretoria, in fact, in uh, TUT, as a nature conservation diploma student at that stage with Paula. Uh, so that's how we, we know one another. But uh, thank you guys so much for, for having me here today. My name is Kaylin Pariachi. Yes, I'm the co-founder of uh, the foundation, KNF Conservation Foundation. Uh, but uh, we, call, we don't call it owner because it's a non-profit organization. So I am one of the directors uh, at that foundation. The foundation is an environmental research and education organization. So that's what we do. We look at uh, finding answers and teaching people like yourselves, the public, government officials, Whoever needs that type of data and information. Can you guys take a minute and back to the mic? Sorry, I'm Yes, yeah. Can you guys all hear me? Smile. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, cool. So, yeah, um, we, we, we look for answers in the environment with wildlife, uh, with species, landscapes, and we try to synthesize that information and teach people about it. Um, pass on as much knowledge as we, as we can, all right? So at the, at the foundation, we are based in Johannesburg, but the majority of our work is actually in the cradle of humankind and the surrounding areas. Does everybody know where the cradle of humankind is? Yeah, who can explain it to me? Who, who wants to tell me where it is exactly? I see a lot of shy people in front of me. Guys, this is, by the way, by the way, before we get going, this is not meant to be a lecture. This is a discussion. So as I said, we like to, the, the, the main aim of KNF Conservation Foundation is to gather information and teach others. But these talks are an opportunity for, for, for us to learn from future, future environmental scientists, conservationists, ecologists. You guys are the ones that are gonna take over from us. So it's important for us to get an understanding of what you know and expect from this field. So please don't feel shy. Uh, if I ask questions, go ahead and answer them. If you guys have any questions, just let me know. We'll stop the bus and discuss a little bit. This is what it is. It's gonna be a discussion for the next 45 minutes or so. So again, cradle of humankind, where is it? Okay, everybody heard of Maropeng? Yeah? Who says, hands up, who says Maropeng is the cradle of humankind? One. Who says it's bigger than just Maropeng? Fantastic. You already know more than 80% of South Africa's population. Okay, cradle of humankind is about 50,000 hectares in the northern part of, uh, of, of Gauteng. That's where the majority of our work happens. And probably one of our most important long-running projects that we've, been, uh, that we've been running for about seven years now is called the SNE Initiative. Okay, it stands for SNE Neutralization Awareness and Removal Effort. So as it may suggest, the project is aimed at fighting poaching wildlife poaching, through active mitigation, awareness, and education. But before we delve into SNE a little bit more and give you a better understanding of what the project does, um, I think it's important to take a step back and look at poaching as a whole, and as, a, as, a, as, a, as a holistic topic. What comes to mind the minute I say wildlife poaching? What is the first thing that pops into your head? Anybody? Rhinos, I heard rhinos. Anything else? A little louder. Armadillos. You're talking about pangolins. Good stuff. You're right. So, so pangolins, are, pangolins are a new thing, actually. It's, it's been a problem for a long time, but the general public have only really picked up on, on, on pangolin poaching relatively recently. The ma majority of people that hear the words wildlife poaching immediately think about one or both of these species, rhinos and elephants. Okay, we're not, we're not unique in that. People around the world associate poaching with just these two species. But why? Why do we, why do we associate rhinos and elephants with poaching? Marketing. Marketing. Right. And what about elephants and rhinos are poached? Is it the meat? What is it? 
horns and tusks, right? Something so simple, actually. Horns, as most of you, if not all of you, should know, is made out of what? Keratin. Same thing as our fingernails and our hair. Tusks, just fancy teeth, right? But it's because of the, the demand for these products that it's created a huge market, illegal market, for rhino horn and, uh, and tusks because of two main reasons. Traditional beliefs and status. Vanity, really. And because of this, thousands of these animals are ki killed every year. We all know about it. You mentioned marketing is really, really good on it. So prob probably the majority of you, if not all of you, already know quite a bit about elephant and rhino poaching. But what about other animals? We know, we heard pangolins are, are, are targeted as well. Are other species also a threat of poaching? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no, first of all? Who thinks yes? Of course. So, I've got a short video for you guys to, look, uh, to watch, uh, and then we'll discuss it afterwards. All right, so the answer, of course, is an emphatic yes. Do other spe or other, are other species at threat from poaching? And that's, of course, yes. You just saw yes. So 
It's a good question. So what is, what is poaching, or what are the root causes of poaching? Anybody? Why do people poach? Poverty. Poverty. Yeah? The need for food or the need for money. The cradle of humankind sits in a very unique, unique position between two of Africa's busiest cities, constantly growing. And with those cities, with those busy urban centers come a lot of people. A lot of people come from rural areas to work in the cities. What do we have when we have tons of people? We have uber wealthy and uber poor. The more poor people, the more people without the means to, to get food, to make money, the more, more chance you have of them bridging the gap or, or making ends meet by poaching. Hence why the cradle of humankind. The first video was in Tuaing, not too far from here in the north um, of Pretoria, a place called Soshinguve. There's a, there's a meteorite crater right in the middle of Soshinguve, and that place is riddled with snares. Okay? Again, it give the, the surrounding that area are very poor communities. That's a lot of the time how they make ends meet. Hence why we have so many, so many snares in this area. Okay. In fact, interestingly enough, since COVID started, we've seen an increase. While WWF actually recorded a decrease in, in rhino poaching, we've seen an increase in snare poaching because of people losing jobs, having less money, needing food. So I want you, that was a very important question. I want you guys to keep that in the back of your head. We're actually going to discuss it a little bit further on. Uh, think about why people are doing what they're doing. All right. So, Yes, animals, look, animals are, other animals other than uh, rhinos and elephants are poached. But as you can see, and as you probably know already, it's not the same way. It's not, they're not using rifles, they're not using this type of uh, equipment. The biggest threat facing wildlife in Asia and Africa at the moment comes from wire. You know, simple piece of equipment, sometimes so simple that children as young as 10 years old are using it and using it very effectively to catch wildlife. And of course, that wire that we refer to are called snares. Okay. Who here today doesn't know what I mean when I talk about snares? Perfect, everybody. Who here has never seen a snare or held a snare? You want to come up for a second? Sorry, I'm picking on you. You're the first one I saw. <laughs> Just pass these around. These are examples of the snares that we found in the cradle and surrounding areas. So take a look at these, pass them around to the rest of your, uh, the rest of your classmates before you go. Take note at the shape, size, feel. They aren't all the same. You can, I'm sure you can barely see this from where you're sitting. We're gonna pass this around. One of the most common snares that we find are single strand wire. Thank you so much. I'm going to call on you a little later. Yeah. Cool. So while wire is the most, uh, or most common uh, form of, or most common material used for snares, uh, you saw on the video, it's not the only one. We've had snares made out of plastic bags, um, simple shopper bags that are wound into very, very strong th uh, th uh, threads or strands and turned into snares. Okay. How snares work is... Your wire, let's talk about wire now because it is the most common. They're twisted and tied into what we call a noose. The loose end, or the tag end, we refer to this as the tag end, is tied to a very sturdy anchor point, normally a tree, uh, a tree trunk or a log that's very hefty, very heavy and lodged in between rocks. The noose itself is then placed over a, an animal path normally leading to and from water or very, um, very well-used foraging areas. But it doesn't, it doesn't stand up on its own. Poachers use what we call snare stays, basically pieces of equipment to keep that noose open. The most common snare stays look like these. Twigs, branches from trees. They're sharpened at the end, pushed into the dirt, and they're slit to just hold the, uh, the noose open. That's all you need to keep these snares open. Now, animals park, uh, walking down um, this animal path, it normally gets tangled around their neck or around their legs, sometimes entire bodies, 
sorry, what's your name? Ron. Ron. Come off here for a second, Ron. You're going to be our, our animal for today. You look like a bit of a beast, so come on. Cool. So, let's imagine Ron is an unsuspecting zebra, walking down a, a path, foraging on either side, and he gets tangled up around his leg. Pass your arm. Yeah, one arm. There we go. The minute the snare touches Ron's back or, or the side of his leg, his instinct is to move away right. So, Ron, try and move away. The more Ron moves and the more he struggles, the tighter it gets. How's that feel? If you didn't have thumbs, could you take that out just by walking away? No, right? Super, super tight. The more this animal struggles, the tighter the snare gets. Thanks, Ron. You can actually take this and pass it along if you like. So, um, here we go. Take these guys off. These equipment, oh, this equipment is so effective because it uses the animal's natural instinct to get away from danger against it. As you saw, the more he struggles, the tighter it gets. The tighter it gets, the more damage it does. Animals can struggle, especially your bigger animals, can struggle on these snares for weeks before they actually succumb. Very, very cr uh, cruel pieces of equipment. So that's what, that's what a snare stay looks like in, uh, in the field. You can see that loop, the noose, is held open perfectly. It doesn't need to hold it very tight. It just needs to hold it until an animal gets caught. The minute the animal gets caught, the anchor point does the rest of the work. We've had giraffe. In fact, we've had, with that, that, that wire that Ruan had around his arm, we had a, a rhino, a little bit thicker, in fact. In fact, the one that, this, uh, what's your name? Anushka. The, the one in Anushka's left, uh, left hand. We've had a black rhino caught in something like that. That rhino almost lost its head. It was almost completely taken off by that, by that wire. So you can see it doesn't have to be super, super thick to be strong. If, as long as the anchor point stays in place, it works just fine. Any questions before I carry on? Yeah, so, so guinea fowl, any of your, your game birds, guinea fowl, Franklin, spur fowl, but also things like scrub hare, rock rabbit, um, sometimes dussy, but uh, hare gets, gets caught a lot in that. Those thin ones are what you find majority of the time along fence lines, okay? So a lot of people, especially here on the high felt, uh, believe that their farms are, are thank you very much, uh, their farms are immune to poaching because while I'm on a grassland, right, there's no trees or anything like that. If you have a fence around your farm, the likeliness is you have poaching on that farm because fences provide what we call a forced choke point, somewhere that forces animals under or between. Your, bo your bottom strand of fence is very easily used to funnel animals between properties or even within properties but between areas. So if you have fences, check those fences. You will have snares on them. We had a, a, a farm owner probably about six months ago that called us, uh, that his neighbor called us out and said there's poaching. But he had no savanna. He, he was literally just grassland. And he insisted there's no poaching on that property. Within 45 minutes of walking his fence lines, we found 36 snares. He's never known there to be snaring or poaching on his property before. So fence lines, guys, fence lines, fence lines, fence lines. All right, so did you know? So we, we, know, about, we know about elephant poaching, right, and rhino poaching. We know the numbers. But a lot of people don't realize that we lose more wildlife, biodiversity as a whole, to snare poaching than both elephant and rhino poaching combined. It's, it's, a, it's a fact coming from East and Central Africa. We know that animals are, we're losing more animals to this type of poaching. We asked why. Why is it that? Because of, because of uh, hunger, poverty. The, the individuals taking part in this type of, of poaching are looking for food. The meat that they gather from this type of poaching is what we refer to, the, to, to bushmeat. And the trade is called the illicit or the illegal bushmeat trade. What is the difference between game meat and bush meat? 
Who can tell me? Who, who of you are hunters here? Like legal hunters, not, not po well, po if you guys are poachers, we need to have a talk later, but who of you are hunters? Hands up. All right, hunters, what are the difference, or what is the difference between bushmeat and game meat? You're on the right track, on the right track. Anyone else want to venture a guess? For hunting in South Africa, what do you have to do? If you want to be a legal hunter, what do you have to do? You have to get licenses, right? Okay. As a poacher, there's no such thing as licenses. So the products that are coming out of poaching, any type of poaching, but specifically bushmeat poaching, is illegal. The key word there is illegal. Legal, harv legally harvested wildlife meat as opposed to illegally harvested wildlife meat. So you and I can go to a butcher and buy ourselves a piece of kudu or whatever. That is game meat because it has been harvested legally. Someone has farmed that animal. Someone has legally hunted that animal. It is 100% legal. Bush meat, as you said, it could be anything. It doesn't have to be uh, uh, an ungulate or something that we know. It could be jackal, could be caracal, could be bats but it is illegally sourced, illegally harvested. There are no permits associated with it. That is the key difference between your bushmeat and your game meat. In America, snaring is legal. So if you place snares in America, you have a permit to do so. You are not a poacher. In South Africa, there is no legislation to allow for trapping of any kind unless it's for research purposes. So if you trap, you are a poacher. You are aiding in the illegal bushmeat trade. All right, so that's the key, uh, the, the key difference between the two. Always remember that because we do have, when you guys get into the field and you start working with this, that becomes very, uh, very problematic, especially when you're looking for funding overseas. Try and get funding from a pro-hunting group in America saying that this is part of poaching you'll probably find uh, hen's teeth a lot easier than you'll do funding. So keep that in mind. It's always important for you guys, as you guys are the next guardians and the next custodians, to explain this to the public. It's important for us. Public communication, very important. Explain the reasons why poaching is poaching, bushmeat is bushmeat. All right. So, with this, besides the, the, the cruelty, besides the... The, the issues you have with how animals suffer in the snares. Why is it bad for the population? Why do you think snare poaching, specifically snare poaching, and the bushmeat trade is bad for wildlife populations? Uncontrolled? uncontrolled? Anything else? You were, very, you were very close on it there with, uh, with what you said earlier, your earlier answer. not for specific animals. So it's uncontrolled, not for specific animals. If you're a rhino poacher or an elephant poacher, you've got your rifle, you go into the bush, that's the rhino, the rhino you want, that's the one you shoot, that rhino dies. As a snare poacher, you don't have that ability. You cannot target a specific animal. It's what we call unselective poaching. Those snares can sit in the bush for months, years. We've had snares sitting in the bush for years. Anything that walks down a path or between that vegetation can get caught. So it could be an animal that the poacher is looking for. Could also be a hyena that plays very, or that, that'll have very little use to that poacher. So what happens? As a poacher that comes to a hyena or something like that, any snare, does he remove it? Of course not. Have you ever tried to remove a hyena stuck in anything? A live hyena? You, know, you, probably, you probably have your arm torn off. In fact, we did have a poacher probably about a year ago in the Michalisburg that was mauled to death by a spotted hyena in a snare on the Michalisburg mountain. For that reason, we have a very high bycatch. Has everybody heard the word bycatch before? Yeah? It's normally used in trawlers, so oceanic trawlers that go through pulling those big trawl nets through the ocean for fish. 
We have a lot of animals that are not target species. That's what we refer to bycatch. Same thing with snares. Bycatch are all the things that we don't want, the hyenas, the lions, the leopards. We have a very high rate of bycatch, making it extremely un uh, unselective and extremely dangerous for animal populations as, as, a, as a whole. All right. Attached to that, to that um, population disruption is the economic value. Everybody knows Tanzania on the east coast of Africa. We know that they have very high tourism, and that tourism is actually ecotourism. The majority of it is ecotourism to that country. By losing huge amounts of animals every year, it impacts on that tourism. The more animals lost out of the Serengeti, for example, the less people want to come there because, well, you're seeing nothing. Most of them have been poached out. A statistic out of, out of, uh, out of Tanzania specifically, let me make sure I get it right here. In Tanzania, every year, they lose over 2,000 tons of wildlife to the illegal bushmeat trade. That's what they've recorded being confiscated. So at the borders, at the airports, they confiscate over 2,000 tons of illegal bushmeat. That's excluding rhinos and elephants. That's excluding what goes undetected or smuggled through without being, being found. That excludes all the animals that have died in the bush that haven't been found as well as all the animals that have been eaten. That is just what is detected by law enforcement. 2,000 tons. It's equivalent to four Airbus A380 aircrafts worth of animals lost to the bushmeat trade that are detected. Remember, as I say, detected. We don't, this, this is a low average. Mozambique, closer to home. They they consume, or the statistics show that an average of 182 to 365,000 tons is consumed every year by Mozambicans alone. That's as much as filling the Empire State Building from the basement to the top of the spire with animals that are consumed. Again, not elephants and rhinos, not pangolins, and not animals that are lost or, or not detected just eaten by the people. These stats are coming from countries that actually have the information. Just two countries in Africa. South Africa, we can't tell you how much is being, being lost to poaching. We, have, we don't have the stats. We just don't know about it. But this is coming from two countries in Africa. Can you see now how it has overtaken rhino and, and elephant poaching? But again, the marketing of rhino and elephant poaching is a lot higher. People don't care about a guinea fowl being poached. They don't. Enforcement has bigger problems than a guinea fowl. But it's one guinea fowl here. Then it's another one over there. Then it's a dussy over there. It adds up. Thanks, bud. It adds up to these types of numbers. And that's why we, we've started this program. As I said, this is coming from countries that do have the data. They have something. South Africa has nothing. There's been a bigger drive in the last couple of years to get that information. The SNE initiative is actually part of that program, is to generate that information so that we know what's happening in our backyard. I can tell you now, if we take a, if we take a drive to the center of Joburg, or even Pretoria, the local parks around Pretoria, we'll find snares. We'll find dead animals in those snares. I can guarantee you that right now. But people don't know about it. So the SNE initiative started as a research program to get that information try and figure out where do we stand in this big picture, uh, in Africa as a whole, and in Asia. This type of poaching is very prevalent in Asia, in, in Asia. After running for a few years, we started looking at, look, looking at the data that we're gathering, speaking to the, to the landowners. We realized very little information or very little resources have been pushed into this type of poaching, into the bushmeat trade and the snake poaching um, as have been pushed into rhino and elephant poaching. The idea was to uh, gather this information and start educating the public. That's where the education program came in, our talks, our, our field excursions with, with the public, to try, just try to get people more aware. A more knowledgeable public is a more formidable public. 
You know, there's only a few teams in South Africa, in Africa, that are running these types of programs. Um, the anti-poaching teams that are out they look for snares as, as an ancillary activity, something that they kind of do on the side as they're going through their, their, their daily business. The more public members that are aware of this, taking care of their own properties, the more information and the better, better equipped we are at dealing with uh, snare poaching in the bushmeat trade. And of course, after years and years of gathering data, we needed somewhere to put all this data that we grabbed. We've got spreadsheet upon spreadsheet upon spreadsheet of information, baseline information, on this type of poaching. So we've, we've started creating a database that is shareable between landowners, conservation authorities, other nonprofit organizations, so that we can start to put together a bigger picture, like what they have in Tanzania, what they have for Mozambique. And of course, as conservationists, if you guys leave here today with knowing nothing else, but this one fact, without the community surrounding your areas, nothing you do will work. If you leave here understanding that fact, my job's done. As future conservation leaders, and that's what you guys are, you guys are gonna be the next conservation leaders. Without including your communities, and without having buy-in and acceptance of your communities, no matter how good your projects are, no, no matter how dedicated you are at it, you will lose. I can guarantee you that now. For our program, we wanted a, commu we wanted a community development program to kind of bind everything. The conservationists, the community members, um, the reserve managers. So we, de we developed the Snare Art Program. This program is aimed at building businesses in the community through art, combining the science with art, you know, something that people we don't normally kind of put together, the sciences and art. We remove the snares and we contract local companies to make pieces of art that are then sold on and used to generate funds for the foundation, for the, for the snare program. We build businesses within the community to help guide young people away from poaching and rather towards a life of entrepreneurship and business um, acumen. All right. We work with a number of organizations that also assist us with building these types of businesses as um, guidance counselors and business counselors to help them do what they do best. The idea was to conserve wildlife ha and habitats, but also conserve local traditions. Wire art is a true African art form that has evolved with the communities and the wildlife for generations. Combine the two, and we got the uh, snare art program. Now it's normally around this time that I start to, you know, look at the, uh, look at the, the audience and say, how do you guys think you can get involved? So that is my question to you right now. Who here can tell me now today, starting today, what? easiest ways for you to assist in anti-poaching, wildlife and species conservation? Assist. Good one. Funding is always, always an issue in conservation. Donating, yes. As the general public, I agree. And if you have the, the opportunity to or the ability to, yes. You guys are a step ahead right now. The fact that you're enrolled in nature management, you're above that right now. So I need you to start thinking as conservation managers. Donating, yes, don't get me wrong, do it, it's right. But what can you do as informed nature managers? Create awareness, that's a great one. How, how would you create awareness? What are simple, simple ways that you can create awareness? Hundred percent. Sure, sure. That's exactly it. Now that you know a little bit more, you spread it amongst the people that where it counts, right? 
community. Yeah, that's it. And that's part of awareness. Exactly. That's perfect. Use the tools that you have at your disposal. When Paula and myself were in, in, in nature conservation, when we started off, we didn't have nearly the level of tools that you guys have now. Facebook was a foreign concept. Still is a foreign concept, actually. <laughs> yes, I am very old. <laughs> it is a foreign. You guys have tools that previous conservation specialists never had, and they're free. They're easy to use. So that's a perfect, perfect example of spreading awareness using the tools that you have available to you now. Anything else? Yes, 100%. That is a perfect point, actually. Where do decisions around conservation get made? Who can tell me? Is it in the bush in Kruger? No? What about classrooms in schools? Not really. That's where you spread knowledge. It, decisions get made behind a boardroom table in Santon City in Pretoria. The people making the decisions are very rarely conservation minded. Most of the time, the decisions they make are based on what we call the bottom line. How much money or how much leverage does making this decision get for my company, for my group of companies? Those are the people that we have the responsibility of influencing. Helping them understand the common baseline problems facing species and landscapes in South Africa. Start small, start South Africa. Start even smaller, Gauteng. Those are the people that you, people that you influence, people that are not involved at the grassroots grass levels. All right. The sad reality is, looking over this, uh, this class right now, there's a lot of you that, after your, your degrees, will not be in the conservation industry, or at least directly in the conservation industry. But you are conservation-minded. So even if you choose to go out and get a corporate job, you still know more than the average corporate individual. Again, because that is your passion and that's what you've learned, it's our responsibility to spread it amongst our peers. Who's going home tonight to mom, dad, mom and dad, brother, sister, that aren't involved in conservation? That's your first port of call. I can guarantee you they have no idea what's going on when it comes to this. Speak to them. Speak to everybody that will listen. Spread knowledge. Say, hey guys, did you realize snare poaching is a thing? Did you realize that Tanzania loses 2,000 tons of animals to snare poaching in the bushmeat trade a year? Those are the people you speak to. If they speak to two or three more people, we've already increased our reach as conservation managers. How about who, who enjoys being in the bush? Who, who chose this career because they don't want to be in an office? <laughs> that's, a, that's great. That's perfect. So, already, I can probably guess most of you are going to go hiking in the next couple weeks. Probably go hunting, fishing. Keep your eyes open. You know what you're looking for. You know that you're looking for wildlife tracks. You know you're looking for what we call choke points. Areas where animals are forced down a specific area. Keep an eye out. Don't just remove those snares. Gather that information. In fact, send it to us. Drop us, a, drop us an email. Drop us a WhatsApp. Drop a, give us a call. If you find these snares, gather that information. GPS coordinates. What is the material gathered? Uh, what is the material that's making up that snare? All this type of information adds to our database and adds to our knowledge and the tool against fighting poaching. Yeah. Everywhere, everywhere. We've got program. We've started a program. Unfortunately, we got it started in 2019, and then uh, COVID came along and locked us down. But we've got a program running in Uganda at the moment with the chimpanzees. So um, anywhere that you find snares, send it through to us. We're in contact with uh, colleagues of ours in Indonesia, trying to fight snare poaching uh, for tiger conservation. So 
the more information we have, the more we can share globally to help people make um, better decisions, better conservation management decisions, and better public decisions in general. There's a lot of people that actually purchase illegal bushmeat without realizing that they're purchasing, purchasing illegal bushmeat. It's not that they're bad people, it's because they're uninformed. So the more information we have, the better it is. All right. Any questions, guys, on what you saw or what you've seen or That's a, it's a good question, man. Good question, and it's really difficult uh, because it comes down to enforcement. You can regulate it, but what does that mean? That means you have to pay for permits. You have to have seasons, dedicated seasons. Snakes are very easy to come by. You go and steal them off a fence line, pull them off of a rubbish dump. So because they're so easy to come by and so easy to use, it's very difficult to regulate. So in theory, Yes, probably it would. But the practical application of it will be very difficult to enforce. Any other questions? Any other thoughts on how we can actually fight this that maybe I haven't, even, haven't thought of or haven't spoken about? Would we consider it? Yes, we are. So we are. So in Uganda, we're working with a team called uh, the Kibale Chimpanzee Trust that has a dedicated uh, snare removal program. In the cradle of humankind, we're working with a number of uh, security companies that, again, they used to do it, but kind of on the side as, as a part of, you know, just if they come across it. So we've educated them. We've done training with them to give them an understanding of what to look for. So yes, short answer is we're working with them. We're always keen to work with more, more organizations. Anyone else? Any questions? Yeah. Catch. OK, so um, first and foremost, we are a research organization. So we're not a, we're not a law, law enforcement organization. So technically speaking, we, are not, we have no mandate to uh, apprehend or arrest anybody. That's why we work with uh, security companies or anti-poaching teams that are established to do that. When it comes to snare poaching, and when it comes to snare poaching in urban areas, prosecution is very difficult. You've got to prove that they're poaching. I can walk around. This is not illegal to walk around with. I can walk around with it. Doesn't mean I'm a poacher. Even if you catch me in the bush with it, I'll pick this up off the ground. You can't tell me that I'm poaching. The only way that you can prosecute a person for poaching is if you catch them in the act. That means you he set up this post, him setting up a snare, and then leaving with it. That entire chain has to be recorded. Is that possible? Possibly not. So it's very difficult when it comes to that type of um, prosecution. Dog hunting is the same thing. It's not illegal to own a dog. It's not illegal to walk your dog. It's not illegal to walk 10 dogs. You literally have to catch them with their dogs killing an animal and collecting it. Dog hunting, by the way, guys, is a big thing in hunting at the moment. It's come up from the Western Cape over the couple of years. They call it taxi hunts, and it's, it's for um, illegal gambling. So guys driving a taxi, three or four handlers, they release dogs, and then they bet what's caught first, how many is caught first, who kills first. So they just cut fences. So they come across the property, cut fences, release dogs, and then start betting. Eyes out, it's happening. It's come up to Gauteng in a big way. So keep an eye out for that. I saw a hand somewhere, yeah. Bushmeat. So, you, the ideal, the ideal situation, what we do, we work very closely with the green scorpions. Has everybody heard of the green scorpions? Yeah, environmental law enforcement uh, throughout the country, but we, we have a very good relationship with green scorpions Gauteng. And we actually contact them di uh, directly. Uh, they send out a, uh, an inspector, and then they'll deal with the legalities of that. Generally, if there's bushmeat involved, uh, the, the, 
the, either the anti-poaching team or the security team with us will apprehend the individual and wait for green scorpions to get onto scene. And then they'll at least hand it out from there. Does everybody have the number for the green scorpions or environment? Uh, okay. Paula, just remember, remind me to, to send through the number. It's a number that as environmental conservationists, we should all have on our cell phones, speed dial. They will answer and they will come. Especially, I can speak to Kharteng specifically. They have a team waiting to respond to anybody that, is, um, that calls the hotline. So I'll send, I'll make sure you guys get the number. It's a, it's a free, toll free uh, line that you, ju you just call and lay a, a complaint and someone will be there. Okay. No. Yeah. It's very difficult in urban areas. As a, as a landowner, yes. Uh, for tres if they're on your property, trespassing is probably the most, the most you can do. It's very enforcement, guys. We've got the legislation. We have great environmental legislation. It's the enforcement that's the problem. Cool. <laughs> I'll come do that. <laughs> guys, thank you so much for having me. Uh, the contact details are there. If you have any questions, please get a hold of us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, guys. Much appreciated. Hey, thank you so much. Um, it's always a pleasure listening to you.
So you will you will make uh, uh, maybe you will not We think uh, they will be here forever, but definitely it's not like that. What I want to show you today is a little bit about our company, um, what we do, and then also the technology that we deploy. So I'm not going to go into too much detail regarding high technical, uh, what the equipment is doing by itself, but I just want to give you an impression in terms of what is available out there, what can be done, um, and how people around the, the country and the world is getting involved in the fight against poaching. With our collective experience, creativity and innovation, Henson South Africa offers an extensive range of specialized defense electronics and security solutions. Our systems are used by military and security agencies worldwide on platforms ranging from ships, submarines and land vehicles to helicopters, fighter jets, and large centers of operations. From being early pioneers in the fields of direction finding, jamming technology, laser range finders, and helmet mounted pilot display and aiming systems, to advanced in-house R&D and manufacturing that delivers sophisticated solutions and integration with the most advanced platforms in the world. Yet, as we take this big step forward, our sights are set on even greater heights and more progression. We have an ambitious growth blueprint that is already starting to take shape. Hensol SA is a hub of innovative excellence, attracting, nurturing and harnessing local talent to match and exceed the best the world has to offer. This pioneering spirit and capacity has seen us collaborating with key partners across the globe, proving our skills in the international arena. Our employees are entirely local. Our proud South African work ethic and renowned reputation for superior commitment are key to the trust our global clients put in us. Our drive is to be responsible corporate citizens of South Africa, embracing the ethics and standards that let us aspire to our highest ideals. And while our vision and reach are global, our heart is right here in South Africa. We are actively making a difference at home in conserving and preserving our cherished wildlife. Hensol SA integrates our advanced technology into a wildlife protection system that combines signal intelligence, radar, and optics with physical security for wildlife protection. In partnership with local authorities, we have protected more than 1,500 rhino against poaching. Through this, we are helping every day to detect threats and protect what is precious for the future. It's all part of our single-minded commitment to make the world a safer, better place. Insult South Africa is taking everything we learned from seven decades of excellence and blueprinting our giant leap into the future. We have a clear vision. We are steadfast in pursuit of our goal. We plan to become the leading defense electronics and security solutions provider in South Africa and the entire world. We will not waver in this endeavor. Let's take the next step. Heads of South Africa. South African legacy and excellence. Global solutions to detect Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about border security. So you might ask, sorry, you, you might ask why border security? At, at, is it me or is it the mic? Yeah, it's the mic. <laughs> okay, at the end of the day, what do you want to protect? If you want to protect your animals, your plants, you have to make sure that you have something around them as a boundary. And in 99.9% .9 of the cases, that is a perimeter. What we offer is perimeter security uh, in terms of sensors, fences, and things like that. So I'm going to take you quickly through an example because in, when you finish with your studies in, in one year's time, you are going to be the people that's out there that's being faced every day, having to stand next to a rhino carcass, having to take snares out of the field. That will be your responsibility. Some of you will get involved, some of you will get paid for it, some of you will get big money from it. And hopefully 
there's not one of you here today, but that is the reality. Uh, a lot of the people that needs to do conservation, it is sometimes the, most, the biggest problem. So I'm going to take you through a couple of things that I want to show you. Uh, in, in a couple of years' time, you will need to protect your boundaries. You will need to make sure that what's going on around you, and uh, you will also be the guys that need to be aware of what is out there and what can be done. So if we take a normal border um, scenario, we look at the first line of the fence is your fence. Then we add additional sensor that can be simple things like uh, electrification on the fence, uh, cameras, uh, um, as well as sensors in the ground. Then we look a little bit further than the fence, uh, which we call a buffer zone. A buffer zone, uh, we use different types of equipment because we want to look a little bit further. So you typically look at uh, the radar, um, counter UAV, uh, ETZ cameras, as well as uh, communication interception. And then if we go a long way, a, a long way, uh, we call it the early warning zone. And that's uh, predominantly things like long range radar, um, license plate recognition, as well as aerial surveillance. Our company has got the ability to take all of this integrated uh, and show it in a control room. So it's not just sensors out there, it is a, a complete system giving you situational awareness. Going to jump through this very quickly. Um, fences, that's a thing that you will see if you're out there working. Uh, but additional to this, you can get, also get underground sensors, magnetic sensors, uh, cameras, thermal cameras, the one that we've got here today is a thermal camera. Uh, we will switch it on for you a little bit later and then show you exactly how it works. These are examples of a little bit more high-end solutions. Um, I don't know if you have heard any of the Meerkat system in the Kruger National Park. That is a typical radar system. Unfortunately, it's not from us, but we do similar pieces of equipment. A radar takes a signal, broadcast it, it reflects against something, the signal comes back, the uh, system say we detected something out there. If it, it, as the radar is spinning, it will get multiple detections, as the detections creates a track, the software defines it as a track, and then you can start monitoring the movement and things like that. Once you detect the track, you will take a camera, move the camera towards that area, and then you can confirm visually it is a a human or an animal or what is going on there. Then uh, additional to this, we also have cell phone, we also do cell phone interception um, as well as uh, OMSI catcher, uh, drones, uh, it's becoming cheaper and cheaper. So as you know, uh, the high-tech drones is uh, quite expensive and difficult to operate. The normal DGI is sometimes good enough to chase somebody out of the field, so it depends on how you operate and what's your concept of operation in terms of what type of technology you will use. Then we also have uh, long range cameras, uh, we supply airborne systems, uh, lots of number plate recognition, and then we also do that one step further, a little bit of artificial intelligence. All software done in-house, and if you look at the typical deployment, uh, it will be something like this. This is now a, a simple radar system that, that we use predominantly for anti-poaching, but this is an example of how we used it on the Mozambique border, and the images that you see of the vehicles and the people that were captured during the deployment.
Okay, so if you have all this technology, what do you do next? Uh, you bleed some money uh, and you make a difference. <laughs> so part of our uh, social responsibility at the Hazel is to make a difference. And as we have all these types, different types of equipment, uh, we have deployed it uh, in the field and we were able to, to detect a couple of poachers, make, make a difference. Um, we currently protecting uh, John Hughes uh, rhino farm, so that's uh, one of the a very controversial project, but yet um, 2,000 of South African white rhinos is situated in a small area there. And uh, we've been so fortunately, or so fortunate to, to be part of it. And we've been uh, at it this year, so we celebrated four years of year approaching. Or not. So, how did you, how did you add um, technology uh, in the normal run of the mills? We have done uh, interesting things. Uh, we have deployed uh, cameras in trees. We have number plate recognition cameras uh, that's hidden by trees uh, in certain game reserves. We have deployed radars, fixed mobile. We have hidden tracking systems inside rifles. Uh, we've, we've tried it all, and um, myself as background is a system engineer. Uh, so I told the guys in the park many times, it's impossible this will not work. And then uh, I had to eat up my words many times because uh, you just need a little bit of information to make a big difference. So a little bit of technology can go a far away. You don't need the silver bullet. Uh, there is no such thing as a silver bullet, uh, but with a little bit of technology, you can make a difference. So, we also have some uh, collaboration with our partners around the world. Um, from Germany, uh, we have done lots of work on AI with some of our software houses out there. So, we've been fortunately, or fortunate to be, to be out there. It's a <laughs> to do the work as well as to make a difference. My name is John Hume. I have long ago developed a passion for breeding rhino. Long before I even had to protect them. My motto nowadays is, is to breed better and protect better. Before that, we are poaching every month, sometimes every week. We are now in partnership with GDW, hopefully going to put an end to that poaching permanent. We have looked into many and tested many, many technology systems to protect our life. And as a compliment to GDW, it is the first one that has proved itself to be capable of protecting our lives. We need to prove to them and the poachers that if you come on here, you are going to be the loser. Okay, so how do we deploy technology? Uh, in, this, in this picture you can see uh, there's a, on the left hand side is a, it looks like poles, it's a, actually a solid thermal perimeter, which means that the thermal camera detects uh, or detect heat, you get a heat signature, um, there's no lights, nothing in the middle of the night, so nobody can see the cameras, uh, that is a solid fence, um, or in the middle you can see a picture of a radar, that radar system can detect uh, people out at the range of three kilometers, so a radius of three kilometers around the sensor. You can see people walking in. Um, on the right hand side, you can see some of the pictures, uh, the human beings being detected. On the right top, you can see rhinos being detected. What you will see there is a heat map, so it's not a picture, it's not a visual 
optical picture, it's a heat map of what is out there. The fact that the heat map looks exactly like an optical picture is actually just amazing. But uh, white, hot, black, cold. This is just the, the command and control room. Uh, this is just one of our other systems that we deployed at Hang in the Cape Province. Uh, it is uh, detecting and protecting against poacher, avalanche poachers. Uh, we had there, we were there one day, and there were 115 avalanche poachers in the in the, in the sea, in a in a four kilometers piece of coastline. So it is a it's a big market, it's a big threat for our environment, but it, it is out there. So if we look at if you look at how technology is deployed there, you can see that the, we, we use cameras, fixed cameras to detect people, uh, zoom in very closely on, on them to do facial identification. Uh, we have plate recognition systems that we use to detect the number plates. Uh, we flag the vehicles that have been blacklisted. Um, that gives us an early warning of people on their way. And then we also use some other advanced um, cell phone detection uh, systems like that, which we can also deploy. This is an example of a thermal camera. So in this picture, is you will see um, there's a camera there, as well as a solar panel, as well as two backpacks, as well as batteries. So it's situated here. The solar panel and the camera and the backpack batteries is there, and this is the view that you will see. This is another deployment of a camera in, this is actually in Pilatsburg, I think this picture. On the right hand side is, uh, you can see the poachers walking, so what we do is we take a, this thermal camera, put it in the bush, it covers a 700 meters. Um, on the camera itself is a smart uh, artificial rhythm running to detect and define between um, sizes. So we set aspect ratios in terms to eliminate most of, most of the nuisance alarms. And then we connect it uh, via a network of uh, radio links so that we ultimately get to internet. And that broadcast then, once it gets a detection, I get a notification on my cell phone as well as a lot of other guys, and then they can react on it. This is an example of a PTZ camera on a high mast. Uh, this is a deployment uh, we did uh, one night. Uh, we have done mul multiple of these deployments with our equipment. Uh, we know a lot of people out there, so it, we also always if the people is willing to, to make a difference, we are willing to support them. And uh, so we're always out for a little bit of fun as well. This is a deployment of the radar system, uh, similar to the one I showed you with the fixed installation. Uh, this one is similar, the same three kilometers out to human detection in terms of the radius around it. And then you can see people walking. I added the following for you um, today. This is one of the things that we recorded in the Kruger Park, so you will see the buffalo. The buffalo is there next to the river, and then you can see the cat coming in. Interesting to see the, the interac interaction between them. These are the things you see that you usually don't see in the day. So the two of them continues for a couple of minutes and then 
they all disappear. Is there some buck grazing in the riverbed? So you'll see from the image that uh, the everywhere where it is hot, it is uh, giving you a white image, and where it is cold, it's giving you a black image. So the water is actually um, colder. Uh, it's got a scale, so the coldest thing will be the blackest, and the hottest thing will be the whitest in this picture. An, an elephant in the riverbed. So if, you, if you ever wonder, is it really true that they use their ears to cool themselves down? Of seeing the, the uh, you can see how black the ears are. This is a jackal running next to the fence. Okay. <laughs> okay, and then what the technology is really used for, here you can see poachers walking in, this is on the border of the um, Kruger National Park. You'll see that uh, once movement is detected, it will highlight it as yellow. Once it is the algorithm detects it as a human, it will mark it as red. And once it's detected, it will try and keep and follow the movement. So on that first red, we will get a notification on our cell phones, and then after that, then the react. So, uh, that it can run through. Uh, very interesting to see here is that the fact that these people are not at all concerned in terms of lions, crocodiles, wild animals. You can see how relaxed they are. This is uh, prior the time that the moon came out, um, so it was really, really dark that evening. In this case, the, the one walking in front is the guide. So we detected them at the...
Okay, guys, thank you for that. Um, everybody can hear me well, right? Even the people at the back. Hey? It's good, eh? All right, so you obviously had a break now and all that, and um, you've had a long morning, so I want to play you a video, and I want you to just uh, clear your mind before we start stuff. Okay, um, so just I'm going to get out of the way a bit. You're going to work with that. Does that feel good? Hey, guys, come work with me, man. Does it feel good to know that you're going to work with that? Because I've worked with that, and it feels amazing. And what you just saw now, I hope that after this talk, you'll appreciate a million times more. Um, let me just introduce myself. This thing keeps playing over and over again. Um, so... I started my career, uh, here we go, uh, in the in situ conservation industry, which are game reserves, okay. I started when I was in school, I went and volunteered at Valpro and Monte Cassino Bird Gardens, which uh, Valpro is a, a raptor and birds of prey rehabilitation center out in Harkies, and obviously Monte, a lot of you know that. Um, after that, I went to go and, and studied, and I went to Ellis Rush to be an assistant game breeding manager. We bred buffalo and sable and golden bullabies and all those old sorts. wasn't really for me. I didn't think that that was uh, uh, ethical. And I, s I moved over to uh, Ism Velo KZN Parks Board, which is basically KZN Parks Board. Um, there I got involved with community-based natural resource management, environmental education, and day-to-day -day management of the game reserve. Um, and then a post opened up to become a rhino monitor. It was a, a WWF-funded post, and so I've seen all that nasty stuff that the guy previously spoke to you guys about. It's not nice, but um, somebody's got to do it. Uh, it's a very nice life, but then I decided that I needed to study further. So... I came back to the city and um, I started studying and that's when I ended up in the XT2 conservation game which is outside of game reserves. These are zoos and rehabilitation centers and so on. Uh, I worked at Monty 
from a position where I was literally cleaning cages and feeding animals every day and I worked my way up all the way to curatorship. Um, so then when I was busy with that, I realized that, you know, there's a lot of people helping animals and helping habitats and so on, but there's a, a bigger picture, and you'll see that today. Uh, there's not a lot of people helping people from themselves. So it's nice to work in the bush, it's nice to work in a zoo, but I got this selfish feeling that I was keeping it for myself and that people didn't know what was happening out in the world. Um, so nowadays I'm, I'm busy with more with research and greening and consultation, um, but the most important thing is that I actually have a message. Um, and you'll realize the message as we go on. So why am I here today? I'm here today to chat to you guys about conservation as a holistic idea. I want to show you the vulnerability of what you need to protect. And there's going to be a couple of hard truths here. I want to equip you with the awareness and the motivation to participate. So we're going to explore your role in conservation. Now, uh, I want to explore the holistic idea. What is conservation? Conservation is a multidisciplinary thing. There's a lot of different people that do a lot of different things to reach the same goal. And that goal is the sustainable use of space and resources um, for future generations, obviously. Uh, but why do we need conservation? Who can give me an answer? Why do we need conservation? Anyone, you can shout it out. What, what's conservation there for? Anyone? Excuse me? Protecting biodiversity, okay. Anyone else? Anyone, guys? Come on. Yes? Keeping the world as natural as possible. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you the most important reason conservation exists. If we do not protect our ecologies and our natural resources, we will run out of them and we will die. As a species, humans will die out. It's the simplest reason why conservation exists. And I'll show it to you later on as well. The problem with the concept of conservation is people think it's a cause. People think we're going to do this because we want to work with the big and hairies. We want to be in the sticks the whole day. And yeah, those people are so, they're so humble and they're so nice and they do such a lack of job. But people forget that conservation is actually needed for our survival as a species. And we need to change that mindset. So um, I'm going to show you guys a couple of uh, photos and videos. And, and we need to understand the scale of what we're dealing with here. Um, I want you guys to firstly start to think of the uniqueness of our planet. How perfect it is, where it is in the solar system and universe, and how vulnerable it is. I also want you to think about the human chapter of Earth because we have only been here for a very short period of the Earth's history and the Earth will still be there long after we're gone. So I want you to think of when we got here, what we've been doing since then and, and what will happen once we're gone. So um, I'm going to show you a video of a guy that's he's a pastor, okay? And he's busy telling this uh, church group how big the universe is and he's referring to stars and if the earth was a golf ball how many golf balls can fit into something his name's louis giglio and if there's any believers amongst you today go and watch the video it's it's flipping fantastic okay um so the name of the video will be in the corner you can go and youtube it afterwards but i just took out a little piece just so that you guys can understand the scale of what we're dealing with so um Listen to this.
Okay, guys, so it goes on and it takes a while to get to the point. But the bottom line is you can fit seven quadrillion planet Earths into that big star. And if you had to convert seven quadrillion to seconds, that's 225 million years ago. The continents hadn't even split by then. Dinosaurs first started walking on the Earth by then. So we're dealing with numbers and time scales and time frames and distances so big that, I, I mean, I'm, I still struggle to comprehend how, how big this is. And our planet is somewhere in there. Um, so at the end of the day, we're quite vulnerable and we're quite unique. This photo was taken by William Anders, who, is, who was part of Apollo 8 mission that went around the moon. It's called Earthrise, and it's, uh, it's been identified as one of the most influential environmental pictures taken ever because it shows Earth as being finite. It shows Earth as being limited. We only have that. So we're so far from anything similar. We, we're so far from anything as fragile and as special and as unique as this planet. And let me show you how lonely this planet is in its own neighborhood. This photo was taken by uh, a probe satellite that was called Voyager 1. Uh, now, Voyager 1 had to go and explore the outer reaches of the, of the solar system, so behind where Pluto is. And uh, just before it left the solar system, NASA said, guys, please take a picture of Earth as you leave the solar system. This is six million kilometers away, by the way. And that pale blue dot in the top line there, that's Earth. There's nothing else around it. There's no other alternative. There's no second planet to go to. There's, it's just that. So that little satellite is now 23 million billion kilometers from Earth. Earth is the most distant man-made object ever. And um, it travels at 17 kilometers per second. Who hunt here? Do you know the speed of a 243? you shoot at about 58 grains, you can reach about two kilometers per second. That thing's moving at 17 kilometers per second. Remember, there's no air in space. It's a void. The fastest bullet is a 0 0.220, and that moves at about 2.2, 2.3 kilometers per second. If we had to go to where this thing is, if we even just had to go to Pluto, where this, where this picture was taken from, at with the technology we have now and at the speed that we would survive, it would take us 680 years to just get to here where this picture was taken from. 680 years. Your kids will not see a different planet. You will not see a different planet. Their kids won't see a different planet. This is the only planet that our species will ever see. It doesn't matter what Hollywood says. It doesn't matter what NASA says. It is the only planet. Do the math for yourself. It's the only one you will ever see as a species. So let, let's get real here, okay? There's no other alternative. That what you saw there, that is what we have. Okay, what we got when we arrived here as a species, it's all we will ever get. So I want you guys to quickly Google something. I said you can use your phones during this uh, presentation. I want people with fast fingers now. Google something for me. How thick is the ozone layer? Just Google how thick is the ozone layer. I found this out when I was doing my uh, BTEC qualification and I was shocked when I found this out. Does anybody have an answer for me? What's that? That says thick as a five rand coin. Remember the ozone layer is not the entire atmosphere, guys. It is a very specific place within the atmosphere, the upper atmosphere, where ozone particles, O3, comes together and they form a little protective blanket around our planet, three millimeters wide. If I told you that myself, you would have thought, dang, it's like he's in Latin. But you saw it for yourselves. That's it. That's what's protecting us 
from going up into a little vapor. All the water disappearing from the planet. All the living creatures disappearing from the planet, becoming ash. That's what's protecting us from that. Three millimeters. It's vulnerable. Very vulnerable. What's happening to our oceans because of man-made climate change? We've got ice melting all over. Some people will tell you it's not true. But let's say it is true. I know it's true. And all the ice on earth melts. Oceans will rise by 70 meters globally, okay? That puts every major coastal city underwater. That's New York. That's pretty much the entire Italy. It's Los Angeles. It's Miami in Florida. It's Cape Town. It's Durban. It's PE. It's everything we need to trade with each other and to have a functioning global economy. It's gone. Now, have you, who's ever heard of the Pacific Garbage Shore? The Pacific Garbage Patch? Okay, so it's, I'd say probably less than half. You guys can Google this too. We are creating a continent out of waste at the moment. This thing is so big, it's bigger than South Africa, okay? But let's work with stuff that we know here. The Pacific Garbage Shore is 1.6 square, 1.6 million square kilometers big. We're not talking hectares, otherwise we, it's just going to be too much. The Kruger National Park is just over 19 square kilometers. You divide the size of that swirl by the size of the Kruger National Park, you get 82 Kruger National Parks, bigger than our country. That is a solid piece of waste floating in the ocean. You can Google that too later on, and you'll see the map for yourself. Our rivers and landscapes, guys, all around us, it's estimated that there's 7 billion tons of litter floating around on Earth. The biggest animal that exists is a blue whale. On average, it weighs about 140 tons when it's fully grown. It's the biggest animal that we can use for this math. You divide 7 billion tons by 140, you get 50 million blue whales. 50 million blue whales. How many blue whales do we have on planet Earth? Less than 25,000. So we can't even use the example because you'll never be able to picture it. Imagine a 140 ton animal on this campus. It's, it's huge. Put 50 million of them on top of each other, then you'll see how much waste is on earth at the moment. I want you guys to Google something else. Google how many species go extinct daily. Put your hand up if you have an answer, then you can tell us all. Hundred and fifty species go extinct daily. We're talking insects, plants, animal all other animals. Hundred and fifty species are going extinct at a daily rate. How many people are sitting in here right now, more or less? Ninety? That's more than what you see here. That's a species. Every one of you representing a species, more of you. Dead. We'll never see that species again. This is the scale of the issue that we tasked in dealing with. We've only been here for 300,000 years as a species. 10,000 years ago, we started with agriculture and we started making tools and implements and all that to, forward, to, 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 to develop us. So in that 10,000 years, we went from less than a million people to almost 8 billion people today. Can you guys see the problem? Can you see the scale of the problem? We are going to spend a couple of days on this planet when it's put into the perspective of the time frame of our solar system and our universe. So at the moment, it's the planet versus a single species. And I can tell you now, nature will not lose this battle. I'll play you another video to show you why.
guys see the message I'm trying to convey, right? Nature does not need people. People need nature. It's as simple as that. It's a simple fact. So, let's just focus on that for a while. Who's going to turn the situation around? You know, obviously it's a global issue, but let, let me tell you something about the human race. And this sums it up perfectly. Okay? At the moment, everybody should do something. Anybody can do something, but almost nobody's doing something. Because everybody thinks that somebody's doing something. And that's the problem we have with people today, is, is a problem with responsibility and accountability. This is everybody's problem. And it is each individual's problem as well. So it comes down to you and me. The people sitting here today, people that are working to manage natural resources, people that are working to spread awareness about these issues. It's your job. No pressure. I mean, I gave you the stats, but this is going to be your job. If you think that you're just going to drive a game drive vehicle, if you think that you're just going to burn and scrape roads and fix fences, you're mistaken. Then you're selfish. Then you don't deserve to live and work on that game reserve. So where will you make a difference? Well, this is quite cool. They call it Ikigai or Ikigai. I don't know how it's uh, pronounced. Okay. But there's the spelling. You can go and check it out. You can Google it too. And I'm going to use myself as an example. So you look at what you love, what you need, what people need, what you can get paid for, and what you're good at. Well, I'm quite good at the following thing, and, uh, and you know, I love it too, and that's conservation in all forms. So that's my passion. My mission is an awareness, you know, making people aware of what's happening. Okay, my vocation is between what the, what the world needs and what I can get paid for, but I'm not necessarily doing that. I'm in situ conservation on the game reserves and in zoos and stuff. And then you get ex situ conservation, which is what I'm doing now, consulting. I spend a lot of time in an office. It's not nice. I would love being back on a game reserve. I would love being back with animals. But there's a bigger picture, and the scale of what we're dealing with does not allow me to sit on a reserve and take naps. Okay? Not that people that work on reserves do that. Don't get me wrong. Okay? Please don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is, when you go out there, you're going to be part of a big web. It's called the conservation industry. And it's crazy. Whatever you decide to do, do one thing in addition to that. Do some awareness, whether it's for your family and your friends, your colleagues, your boss, your customers. Do some awareness wherever you are. And the challenge in creating awareness is the following. I'm sure you've all seen this, right? Have you seen Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Yes? No? No. Okay, well, it's basically this guy called Maslow said this is what every single person needs before they can change. So before you can make changes or become a better person, all of this needs to be covered first. So once you cover people's needs and people are fed and they've got security and jobs and all this, you can start working with them to change their behavior. Because everybody that's been talking to you about poaching and snares and all that stuff will tell you first and foremost, when you arrest a person that has just poached a rhino or that was fishing in the Pongola River with gill nets, they will tell you while they are in handcuffs, I will be back again tomorrow because there's no jobs and my kids need to eat. Do you understand that concept? I'm not saying it's, it's not wrong. I'm not justifying what's happening. You have a job to protect that place and you shoot, okay? For lack of a better description. But that's what we're dealing with. There's too much demand and there's not enough resources. So once that happens, uh, once you meet people's needs, then you're going to have to deal with barriers. And there's barriers in the form of language and culture and political beliefs and age and all that. And once you cross those barriers, then there's another thing. There's skepticism. You know, I've heard the saying, and sorry for the guys that speak English, I've heard the saying, the enigste goeie slang is a dooie slang. Too many times in my career. Okay, that means the only good snake is a dead snake. 
And if we're still talking like that, but the world as we know it only has a carrying capacity of 28 years left, you can Google that too, this is a problem. We need to start changing mindsets. There's no room for skepticism or doubt or ignorance. So you need to be able to work as a motivator. You need to motivate yourself as well. You need to motivate your audience. And you need to show them that there's a benefit out of what they're getting. So we need to learn a couple of lessons, okay? You need to be completely invested in your environment. And when I use the word environment here, I mean your surroundings, your job, the people you work with, etc. Not necessarily the natural environment. You need to be completely invested in that. You need to earn the privilege of living and working in a natural environment. Because you get paid in sunsets and smiles, and you get to wear car keys and epaulets and drive a Jeep and get a perfect tan, but if that's the only reason why you're there, you don't deserve to be there, okay? You need to constantly develop and improve your skill sets and your knowledge and your understanding of the environment. You must read, you must ask questions, you must develop your knowledge base. Keep studying. After this, do something else. Go do some courses. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And guys, the best way for you to become the best you can be is to get yourself a role model. Just get yourself a role model. Strive to become someone like Kingsley Holgate or David Attenborough or, you know, big names like that. My biggest role model is called Sonto Tembe. He's not a celebrity. And if you, when you look at him, he doesn't really look that bright because he's cross-eyed, like badly cross-eyed. He can do it in a Okay? But Sonto Tembe has got the most amazing skill set and the most amazing passion. And every single person he has taken on a walk has left with something more than just photographs. By the way, those eyes can spot a blue wax ball in a guari bush like a kilometer away. And he handles a 458 the same way I handle my toothbrush. Okay? So the following people have actually done coverage on him. Go on YouTube, you'll find videos everywhere. They've done a, a, a thing on him. Bird life done a thing on him. He's been back and go. And this is his talent. He does male and female there. Okay, so this guy has had a 33-year long career as a, as a guide on a game reserve on the Mozambican border and every single person coming in from the Netherlands or from Germany 
that want specific photos of Pels Fishing Owl or Narina Trogon or something special like that, ask for Sonto. Okay, this guy did not just wake up yesterday and say, I want to be a guide. He spent a lot of time in the bush without saying a word, looking and listening to nature. And that's why he can do what he does. So let's have a bit of a discussion here. Okay, the need for being an environmentally aware nature practitioner is huge. Okay, you need to choose. Are you going to be a reserve manager or are you going to be a permanent holiday maker? And, and, and that takes research and management decisions if you want to do it right. You're going to be a nature guide or a jeep jockey. Okay, you're going to be ethical. Are you going to have skills? Will you be able to show people Orion or the Southern Cross or tell them the story of Orion and Scorpio if you're not seeing anything on a game drive? Will you be able to lick Aristido congesta and show them how it curls to go into the soil or to get stuck on animals' fur? Will you be able to tell them, taste this Terminalia cerussia leaf and tell me what you think? Okay, that is skill. And then, well, you're going to be a zookeeper or animal collector. You guys get the point. So, Here's something to remember. Okay, wherever you are, the work will probably be harder than you think it is now because people have a very romantic view of what conservation work is all about. Okay, they think it's a holiday and it's not. It's nice, don't get me wrong, it is lovely, but it's hard work. Okay, it's long hours, nature doesn't have working hours. Okay, you're going to probably be in a remote location. The comfort you have now, you will probably not have either. We always made a joke that by the end of the working day, you can look forward to a hot beer and a cold shower. Okay? So, <laughs> this, is, this is the reality. But I want you guys to please remember, always remember, the world is still in trouble. Our current world population is standing at 7 point almost 9 million people. I checked the world clock this morning. You can check world clock on Google as well. By the end of the year, we would have reached 8 billion. Okay, 2037, 10 billion. And since 1970, we've lost 52% of all living species of animal. Today, it's lunchtime now, we've already lost 71 species of animal. Just today. It's time to get to work, guys. You understand what I'm saying here? It's time to get to work. And that message that I was speaking about earlier on, I hope you guys got the message, but just to summarize, I want you to look at one last video. I've had the opportunity to work, the privilege to work with this group of people on one or two projects, and their view and their approach to conservation is, uh, to me, flawless, and, and, and I support them all the way. I want you to just have a look at this. I'm going to talk to you now. Well, that's it, guys. Thank you very much. So just one more point behind me here, you'll see an, uh, like an ancient Cree Indian saying, I'm sure some of you have seen that before, but it's uh, some wise words to live by.
Okay, guys, does anybody have any questions for me? A little bit shocked. Yeah? Conservation International. Any other questions, guys? All good. Start liking it. Plezier, jylle dankie. Ja.